the last lecture, I talked a great deal about the importance of the monsoon winds, mentioned the camel, and made the point that the web of interconnectedness was expanding further and further and further, because the world was becoming, in a sense, smaller as things like camels and monsoon winds made communication slightly, diff slightly easier between peoples who had no face-to-face -face contact. This lecture continues this theme and explores the contributions of a continent which we haven't looked at much lately in the course, tropical Africa, the cradle of humankind. Now we come back and look at how it fits into this increasingly interconnected Indian Ocean world. But before we go to the Indian Ocean, I'm going to step back for a moment and take a look at the revolution in desert travel caused by the camel and the rise of the city of Meroe in the Sudan. Then we'll talk about the state of Aksum on the Ethiopian highlands, which dominated Red Sea trade in the first millennium AD. For this part of the lecture, we're going to get back closer to the Mediterranean world, to Egypt and Alexandria and so on. Then, in the third part of the lecture, we'll visit the stone towns of the East African coast, where a distinctive African and Islamic civilization was engaged in the monsoon trade across the Indian Ocean. And then finally, we'll end up in Africa and we'll follow the source of the African gold and ivory trade far inland to the highland plateau of southern Africa and visit the site of Great Zimbabwe and the cattle kingdom of which it was part. The theme here again is interconnectedness between Africa and a wider world. It was an interconnectedness driven by needs, by desires, on both sides of the Indian Ocean, on both sides of the Sahara, and in many other regions. In the 8th and 7th century BC, Nubian lords, as I told you, ruled briefly over Egypt before being conquered and fleeing southward back to their remote desert homeland by the Assyrians in 667 BC. They were treated out of harm's way, and their civilization flourished. But by 350 BC, the successors of the Egyptian pharaohs had moved southwards even further, far from the Mediterranean world, and resided at the city of Meroe, fairly close to modern-day Khartoum in the Sudan. Why they did this was probably mainly strategic. But there may have been another factor too, and that was that ungainly beast, the camel. After 500 BC, the camel was revolutionizing desert travel between southern Arabia and the eastern Mediterranean world. As I said in the last lecture, camels are ideal for crossing deserts. They're known as the ship of the desert because their padded feet travel easily on soft sand, they store fat in their humps, and conserve water very efficiently. But, and this is the big unknown but, a lot of people aren't aware of this, everyone has heard of the camel's hump. It isn't the camel that makes the trade. It is the saddle on the camel that made the trade. And once efficient load-carrying saddles were developed, the camel was so efficient for crossing deserts that it replaced the wheeled cart over enormous areas of southwestern Asia and the rest of the desert world. And as I said last time, an enormous far-flung caravan trade developed with entire communities of people who spent their whole lives on the move in the cosmopolitan world of the caravan. And there were great caravan terminuses developed, one of which, of course, was Petra, the fabled city of Petra in Jordan. Another one was medieval Cairo, places where Saharan trade routes and other trade routes became great crossroads.
the development of the load-carrying saddle and the domesticated camel revolutionized long-distance travel on land. And this revolution extended also to maritime trade. The Red Sea became the crossroads between Asia and Africa and between India and the Mediterranean world. And of all the cities close by, it was Moroe that was most strategically placed to benefit from the trade. From land routes up the Nile, which extended also into the Ethiopian highlands. From caravan tracks and routes, which extended deep into the central and southern Sahara. And with caravan routes that went to the Red Sea, where cargoes were all lifted and taken on cargo ships on the monsoon winds to India. It was one of the centers of the caravan trade, a city that was also extremely prosperous on the basis of its iron working. There were large outcrops of iron close to Moroe, which were exploited extensively, and the iron was traded widely. The kings of Moroe aped the pharaohs. They were black kings, African kings, but they fostered ancient religious beliefs of the Egyptians. This is hardly surprising because their predecessors had been devout worshippers of the god Amun, and when they moved south, deeper into Africa, they took their religious beliefs with them. But Moroe had a transitory prosperity. It was situated in a semi-arid area, and it appears it was overgrazed. But at the same time, the constant tides of trading activity shifted further south in the Red Sea. Why? Because at the mouth of the Red Sea was the island of Socotra, a cosmopolitan island which was one of the major centers for the frankincense trade. Very lucrative. And Moroe was a bit out of the margin. Its greatest prosperity, Moroe's, was in the first century AD, about the time of Christ. It was only once visited by Romans, by two Roman legionaries. It was outside the Roman world, although it was in direct touch with it. And then in about AD 330, as Moroe was beginning to decline, King Izana II of the city of Aksum in the Ethiopian highlands conquered Moroe, which passed into obscurity. Aksum lay further south, high in the Ethiopian highlands, at a strategic location close to the Red Sea mouth. Its port, Adulis, was very strategically placed and controlled an enormous volume of Indian Ocean trade and was in touch not only with caravan routes but with Alexandria at the head of the Red Sea. Here, the Red Sea is narrow. Ideas flowed freely across the Red Sea between Africa and Arabia. Africa had a gateway. The gateway was Aksum. And Aksum, like Manubia in ancient Egyptian times, became a critical conduit for African raw materials. Gold, ivory, hides, and other exotica. It was a tropical marketplace. In exchange, it received goods from all over the ancient world, cloth from India in particular. Aksum was an African state. It was ruled by a hereditary elite who controlled both agriculture and trading activity. These were powerful monarchs at the height of their power in the late first millennium AD, they maintained overland trade routes with Aswan in Egypt, a 30-day camel journey northward. The Red Sea was eight days to the east. The rulers of Aksum lived in imposing palaces built of timber-reinforced masonry 
buildings of local design, but owing something to Roman and particularly Arabian influence. The Arabian influence on Aksum was constant. But Aksum's most spectacular monuments are the royal sepulchres. Each king was buried in an imposing sepulchre, topped by tall masonry columns, some of them as 108 feet high, each of them carved to represent multi-story buildings, as it were, palaces for the dead. There were imposing riches in this kingdom. Aksum, for seven centuries after the death of Christ, was a gateway to tropical Africa for a rapidly changing Mediterranean world. The state's connections extended as far as Rome and Byzantium, to Syria, Armenia, even to the shores of the Persian Gulf and India. If ever there was a state which was a symbol of this new, much more international world I mentioned last time, it was Aksum. It lay at the center of a web of trade routes that linked the Mediterranean, India, and Africa. And it was the predecessor of the ardently international world which emerged with the emergence of Islam in the 7th century. In the 4th century AD, Aksum's rulers adopted Christianity. They were the first African state to do so. In fact, they challenged an expanding Islam in the 8th century. But as Islam grew stronger and the rainfall in a period of warmer times grew more erratic, Aksum went into decline. An erratic rainfall caused the population of the highlands to disperse. But even to this day, there are flourishing Christian communities in Ethiopia, which are the legacy of Aksum. But his most important legacy was to be a gateway for the African world. An African world that lay at the edge of a vast ocean. In AD 70, an anonymous Egyptian Greek skipper compiled the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, the set of sailing directions to the Indian Ocean, which I mentioned last time. Now this manual is remarkable because it describes not only the major monsoon ports, but also the east coast of Africa, south of Somalia, a place where ivory, rhinoceros horn, and the much prized aphrodisiac, rhinoceros horn by the way, tortoise shell, and mangrove poles for wood, for woodless Arabia, were to be found. For centuries, this little known East African coast lay on the edge of the Indian Ocean world, visited by occasional traders. But as the monsoon trade intensified in the late first millennium AD, East Africa was drawn into the expanding web of interconnectedness of the Indian Ocean world. By the 10th century, as Aksum was going into decline and medieval Europe was coming to the full, Islam and Islamic merchants from Arabia had reached the East African coast. They founded small stone-built towns clustered at strategic bays. Their descendants are still there today. Lamu in northern Kenya was such a port. So was Mombasa, also in Kenya. And then the southern port of Kilwa off the Tanzanian coast where an important sultan dwelt and handled much of the trade with Southeast Africa. For many centuries, this port, Kilwa, was an important transshipment point for many centuries where gold and ivory and slaves were sent north and east to Arabia and to India in heavily laden dhows. The East African coastal civilization was distinctive and cosmopolitan, a blend of African and Islamic culture in towns controlled by prominent merchant families. It was an Islamic culture with a very strong secular, secular foundation. And behind this narrow coastal strip, 
Behind mangrove swamps lay the vast little visited African interior from which gold and ivory and copper came, bought the coast by intermediaries through exchange from community from community over hundreds of miles. This East African trade generated enormous profits. Why? because African ivory was much in demand in India. Now it's a little known fact that the ivory of the Indian elephant is rather brittle, whereas that of the African elephant is much softer and much more amenable to carving. Carving for the ornaments, which was such an important part of South Asian ritual. At the same time, while this was one of the staple trades, as were textiles from India coming the other way, more prosaic commodities like mangrove swamps from coast poles from coastal swamps were also staple of the trade. So was iron ore. In exchange, coming into Africa for all these tropical products, which included a certain amount of gold, were cheap Indian cloth and particularly glass beads, strings of glass beads, because glass was never made in Africa. And also, the people of the stone towns collected thousands of seashells, cowries, conus shells, from local beaches, and sent strings of these baubles, like the cheap glass beads, for goods worth a fraction of their value of the exports into the far interior. You see, a glass bead or a seashell had enormous prestige value in the far African interior as a symbol of chiefly authority. As a result, this trade, an interconnect, a dependence between two, developed a symbiosis which was to endure for centuries. Now much of Kilwa's gold and ivory trade, being off the Tanzanian coast, came from the south, from a place called Safala, which is south of the mouth of the great Zambezi River. This vast river served as a conduit to a remote and little-known interior, to remote sources of gold and ivory which lay on the plateau interior over 3,000 feet above sea level, hundreds of miles inland. This, to most people on the coast, was completely unknown territory. But here, occasional trading caravans visited a series of cattle kingdoms founded by Shona-speaking farmers and herders whose ancestors had lived there for many centuries before the first outsiders arrived from the coast in search of gold and ivory. This was cattle country, high altitude, fine pasture land for cattle, plagued a little bit by endemic cattle diseases and by irregular rainfall. But it was sufficient for a series of powerful cattle kingdoms to come into existence on this rolling plateau between the Limpopo River, which is now the northern boundary of South Africa, and the Zambezi River, which is the frontier between Zambia and Zimbabwe, and Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Now the largest of these kingdoms, at the time when Islam reached the coast, was centered on a valley and a low hill which lay at the head of a defile which brought moisture and cool winds from the distant Indian Ocean. Fogs mantled this hill during the dry season, and inevitably this hill became a center for important rain-making ceremonies and ancestor cults among the local herding and farming people. You'll recall from much earlier in this course we talked about the importance of ancestors. Among Shona-speaking peoples in Central Africa the ancestors really were the guardians of the land and these cults and the cults of spirit mediums were of enormous importance in establishing a relationship between the people and the land. And over the next four centuries, powerful chiefs made their headquarters at the foot and on top of this hill and in the valley below. They built enclosures, small-sized ones, between the large boulders on the top of a hill.
And down in the valley, they built a vast freestanding stone enclosure, known to archaeologists as the Great Enclosure. This was the resident of the paramount residence of the paramount chief of this place. And the site itself became known as Zimbahoi, venerated stones, a Shona expression meaning chiefs' houses or graves. Whence Zimbabwe or Great Zimbabwe. So powerful are the nationalistic sentiments aroused by Zimbabwe that it has now become the name of a former British colony, Southern Rhodesia. Now, Great Zimbabwe prospered greatly, both as a religious center, a ritual center for rainmaking, and also as a focus of the coastal gold and ivory trade between A.D. 1100 and 1450. Now, we're not talking about constant caravans going backwards and forwards with the interior. We're talking about occasional expeditions which penetrated from the coastal, coastal plain up the escarpment onto the plateau and engaged in barter of glass bead strings, seashells, Chinese porcelain and other baubles for which they took tusks, gold, and presumably the slaves to carry the ivory on the backs of because there was no other way of moving it. And between about A.D. 1100 and 1450, the three centuries before Europeans arrived, Zimbabwe was a great focus of this trade. Zimbabwe's great enclosure was a secluded place with massive stone wall of easily quarried granite more than 800 feet long and 32 feet high. This was the resident of the chief who dwelt inside in a large mud and thatched dwelling. As for the enclosures atop the neighboring hill, they were important cult centers for both rainmaking and ancestor worship. This was a wealthy, sacred place. By the 15th century, Zimbabwe was the most prosperous of some ten cattle chiefdoms that flourished on the plateau. Not that they controlled a great deal of territory, probably at the most about a hundred miles across, sufficient land to allow both shifting cultivation and large-scale grazing of sizable cattle herds. Now, cattle require a great deal of water, and they also require a great deal of pasturage. For example, it was once estimated that had the Maasai people of East Africa, who were cattle people living in a relatively small territory at the end of the 19th century, been allowed to continue to expand their herds without the constraints of colonial government or cattle disease, they would have required, by 1960, the whole grazable territory of Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania taken together. So the demands on land were high, but it was successful. At Zimbabwe's height, as many as 18,000 people may have lived in the general vicinity of the site. Now, Zimbabwe's chiefs measured their wealth not only in cattle, but in imported goods, such as Chinese porcelain, glass, seashells, and of course, gold and ivory. This is all very well, but they lived in an environment of unpredictable rainfall, endemic cattle diseases, and only moderately fertile soils. One expert has estimated that only about half the soil on the plateau was cultivable for any length of time. So one of the reasons they took up this trade and encouraged it, irregular as it was, may have been as a sort of prudent risk management strategy for chiefs who were accustomed to raise armies and enforce tribute assessments over a wide area. It was another source of wealth, of being able to gain the loyalty of people with gifts. But the risk management strategy failed. In about A.D. 1500, just as the first foreign caravels explored the East African coast, Zimbabwe was abandoned and the gravity of political power moved further north toward the Zambezi, where the trade wheats were prospering. 
Now let's move briefly onto the other side of the continent, to West Africa. West Africans had been major players in the Sahara gold trade since at least the end of the first millennium BC, AD. By that time, there were regular caravans, camel caravans, crossing the Sahara. So much gold came from West Africa that in Christopher Columbus's time, it is said that at least two-thirds of Europe's gold came from the kingdom of Mali in sub-Saharan Africa. And when the king of Mali made a pilgrimage to Mecca in the 14th century, it is said that the price of gold in Cairo, which was of course a major caravan terminus, was depressed for months. West Africa was drawn increasingly into the European orbit after the Portuguese rounded the bulge of Africa in the 1430s. Why were they doing this? They were exploring the coast because they wanted to bypass the Saharan routes controlled by Islamic merchants and obtain gold directly. They were also curious over what lay over the horizon and were also serving God through exploration. They were round the bulge of Africa in the 1430s. In 1488, Bartolomeu Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. By 1497-8, Vasco da Gama had landed at Mozambique and Bombassa, had cajoled an, an Islamic pilot to sail with him and crossed to Goa in India on the wings of the monsoon winds. During the next four centuries, Africans were drawn increasingly into a much wider economic world, fueled by insatiable desires on the part of people all over the world for raw materials and also for slaves. But let it not be thought that the Africans were passive in this trade, as they had been in earlier times, in the stone towns, at Great Zimbabwe, at Aksum, African rulers were aggressive in seizing new opportunities and in acquiring wealth and political prestige. In this, these later rulers were merely acting like their predecessors, pioneers in a world of interconnectedness. And, as any historian will tell you, one of the catalytic events of recent centuries has been Christopher Columbus's journey to the New World, which resulted in the importation of all kinds of Native American crops, like maize, which transformed the economies of Africa, and in a well sense fueled the tremendous economic interactions which went on between Africa and an increasingly industrial world right up into the 20th century. So you can see that the history of African states, of the coast and the interior, is intimately tied to this web of interconnectedness from Europe southward across the Sahara, or on the wings of the monsoon winds across the Indian Ocean, as far as India and China and beyond. It is an interaction not a passive receipt, not a passive giving, but parties on both sides of this interaction, in good faith, filling needs, needs of prestige of African chiefs. A single seashell of a certain type could be worth several ivory tusks in the far interior, for example, because this object had great prestige. And it all began, as we said earlier in the lecture, with the camel revolutionizing desert travel, with Moroi, the terminus of the caravan trade of the Nile. We showed how Aksum took over the control of the Red Sea trade, only to collapse in the face of expanding Islam. We described briefly the distinctive African and Islamic civilization of the East African coast on the fringes of the Indian Ocean world. And we journeyed to Great Zimbabwe in Southern Africa to make the point that Africans maximized their opportunities to acquire wealth and prestige from outside, a trend which continued after European contact. And we'll pursue this theme of interconnectedness further once we've analyzed 
the origins of Chinese civilization in Lecture 28.